One of the things when we start working with invasive species like old world blue stems, one of the first things you have to do is learn how to identify it. And uh, so there's some pictures here on, on that handout that particularly the seed heads that how we differentiate between these old world blue stems and, and their Bothra Chloa is the scientific name. I say walking, walking over here this, this afternoon you know, I saw, saw two of them, and I saw some, a little bit of Caucasian, and it's got a more highly branched seed head, although they're pretty well out, you know, the seed's mostly off these plants. And the other one is silver blue stem. I've had some people ask about it already. It's a related species. It's a Bothra Chloa as well, but it's native. Doesn't seem to be quite as invasive, although I'm hearing more and more complaints about it as they go west in the state. Uh, we see it along the roadsides. I know as you come off the interstate, I saw quite a bit along the roadside. It's got that silver head. I think just over here, 100 feet or so, there's quite a patch of silver blue stem right over there. But anyway, uh, identification on them, I say uh, neither one of these are particularly real, real desirable. Uh, we use that term old world blue stem to really, that's an umbrella term that we use to, to uh, different, or name uh, the Caucasian blue stem then as well as in one we call yellow blue stem. Um, unfortunately, you know, those, one of those two species, if not both, are found in nearly every county now in the state of Kansas. Uh, and if they haven't reported it, they probably just haven't looked hard enough. My guess is it's probably there. Unfortunately, it was seeded along the roadsides a lot of places, and that's been a source of uh, spreading into adjacent pastures, I think, in many, many cases. Um, yeah, I, th I think it probably dates back to the 1930s when, when they first were used. Uh, so they've been here a long time. Um, there was some planting of old world blue stems in I think the, what we'll call the soil bank days, uh, late 50s, early 60s. Uh, some of that was planted and occasionally I'll run into a spot uh, where you know might be 80 or even 160 acres that was seeded to that. Um, but during you know the more recent farm programs uh, like CRP. Uh, we've not recommended old world blue stems be planted in this state at all. Uh, unlike in the southern plains, Oklahoma and Texas, uh, they've used those species quite a bit. Uh, they're frankly, they were cheaper to plant than, than our native mixes. Um, but then, you know, within 10 years, you know, and they're ready to come out of CRP, one of the first questions or reports I saw in Weed Science Journal was how to get rid of the stuff. You know, they want to go back to weed or something like that. And, and of course, it took both combination of tillage and glyphosate to do that. Um, so as, as Keith mentioned, I, I, my first experience working with old world blue stem was just over here on kind of the top of the hill. By that time, Keith had actually done a little bit of work. He screened a bunch of grass killing herbicides. And out of those initial studies, he found that there, there are two in particular that seem to have some, show some promise and that was glyphosate or Roundup, we'll use that term. And, and then Amazapir or Arsenal would be a trade name you might be, be familiar to you. So based on that, I did a little study over here and I looked at rates of, I think, two, three, and four pounds of, of glyphosate. And then at that time, we're using one and one and a quarter pounds of Arsenal, which, by the way, is off-label. Uh, the label that's present today, I think three quarters of a pound is, is the maximum rate that you're to use on with using arsenal. So I don't know whether you, you brought along the handout or not, but um, in that handout, I did give you some data from those initial studies in 2006 and seven. And uh, you know, you look at that set of data and yeah, we were getting re reasonably good uh, reduction of, of cover with the way I rated the plots in terms of old world blue stem, and it was Caucasian blue stem. Um, you know, and Mazapir gave, you know, 98 to 100% control uh, those two years rated a year after treatment. But again, those are, those are pretty high rates. Um, and then the other thing I found is I was trying to, I tried to estimate what survived those treatments. And of course, like you'd expect, you know, glyphosate's pretty tough on most actively growing plants. And so I was seeing, you know, 98 to 100 percent reduction of the whatever warm season grasses were present so pretty well took those out 
But what I notice in the Amazapir treatments, even though at that high rate, I'd have some warm season grass that survived. Now, was it below the canopy, you know, what I sprayed? I, I don't know. But when I rated those plots, you know, there, there, was, there was warm season grass present. I remember in particular uh, seeing a clump of, of Indian grass uh, that survived those, those initial treatments. Uh, you know, I put a picture in there, you know, that a year after putting out three pounds of glyphosate, it was almost a solid plot of mare's tail or, or horseweed. You know, that's, that's what came back in there because it took out most everything else. I don't remember seeing that species in those plots initially at all, you know. So it was either, you know, maybe along the road, seed in the soil, but it sure came back uh, being an annual, annual species. So based on those studies where I was seeing these warm season grasses, some of them surviving, I decided to do a rate study uh, with a Mazapir. And I went to do those studies, and most of my work since has been done down in Chase County. I work primarily in the Flint Hills. Um, so I tried rates of, of a quarter, a half, three quarters, and one pound the acre. Again, I've got a couple of tables there, a study done in Chase County. The other one was done in, in Riley County. A little bit different uh, scenario there with terms of uh, how they managed. Um, the Chase County plots uh, basically had, had been burned on a reg being burned on a regular basis. Uh, I, I tried to purposely pick a, a mixed stand where, you know, that yeah, there was significant cover of the old world blue stem, but some native left in there because I wanted to see whether or not I'd hurt the native grasses. So I did that on purpose. You know, over, over here, they were pretty solid, <laughs> pretty high percentage of, of uh, old world blue stem to start with. So if you look at, if you see the data, again, even starting with a quarter and a half pound uh, of amazapir, you know, old world blue stem started in that Chase County study, started about 30% of the cover, and it was only, you know, a year after treatment, it was about 10% in the quarter pound, 8% with a half pound. Anyway, th those rates were as good as the higher rates, you know, quarter to half pound. So if you've seen any of our recommendations, that's generally what we're talking about. If I was going to use a quarter pound, I might consider treating twice. Uh, one time, maybe maybe a half pound would be what I'd recommend. And then what what came back then? If you look at the warm season grasses, they went from you know that from 19% of the cover, you know, up to 30, 40% with that quarter to half pound of, of mazapir. So they were replacing, uh, at least in the cover basis, what was present once the old world blue stem declined. Uh, you probably see there's probably some some uh, increase in bare ground when you treat as you're taking out some species. The other thing though is that the forbs uh, seem to survive quite well. We found that that arsenal isn't particularly a great broadleaf weed killer. You know a lot of things we we spray pastures for where we may we we're after some of these broadleafs, but amazapir at a high rate is a bare ground treatment. So you gotta be a little careful about when you're applying it and make sure you're calibrated because you put on too high a rate, you'll take out about everything. Uh, but that quarter to half pound, you're gonna be, be safe. Uh, some of the forbs, you know, there, there's, you know, typical, like I looked at some of the data here just this morning on what sort of forbs were coming back. You know, a lot depends on what's around, what's present, uh, what's in the soil bank, you know, in terms of seed. But yeah, you know, things like, like heath aster, I don't see any of those right, right here, that little white flowered one that's, that's present. Uh, this white sage, Louisiana sage wart, some of that survived. Of course, ragweed seemed to be present in those plots. Uh, prairie cone flower, you know, a wild alfalfa is, it's a legume. And then occasionally we'd find what I would consider even some better legumes like purple and white prairie clover would survive the uh, amazapir treatments. Uh, so that, that was a good thing. Uh, some of those same species, you know, uh, uh, since that time I've, I've treated with glyphosate, and I guess we'll, we'll, I'll come back to that, um, because, you, you know, you'll see those same species, but uh, like I saw here, mare's tail often is a, is a one that comes back. The other study, a uh, rate study was done in Riley County that same year, uh, didn't have as big a reduction in the old world blue stems, and there was only 7% warm season grass 
present to begin with. Uh, it's pretty low percentage, so I didn't really see much increase in that case of warm season grasses. The Forbes came on like gangbusters, but uh, didn't have much warm season grass. So there's some threshold, I think, of cover. Once, if you're above that, you know, you get this 50% or higher cover of old world blue stem, uh, it's gonna be pretty slow process to bring anything back and probably something like what they've done here is what's gonna be more effective that Keith will talk to you about. If you have questions as I go along, just go get my attention and we'll, we'll deal with them as, as they come, come about. But um, some other studies, I put a pair, picture in there, some little bit larger plots that I treated uh, with a mazapir, the, the arsenal. This, this is a quarter pound. Actually, I treated some once and, and twice. And you get a pretty big, quick burn down. Normally, our studies have been done, uh, the initial ones we work with kind of young plants, you know, four to five leaf stage, June, early June. I've treated into mid-July. Um, and then I don't, this picture I, I've got in here shows the one the burn down, and then the one on the right is, is taken three months after treatment, and the old real blue stem is brown, and, and what's green growing in there is native warm season grass. So it was surviving pretty well, even though there's you know, not, not a big cover of it. Uh, another study that I've done in Chase County, this is 2016, you know, treated on July 8th. And uh, at that point, I was, I was just kind of comparing a half pound of Arsenal and two pounds of, of a Roundup product. If you look at that, the Roundup data, what, what you see, uh, we doubled the bare ground, which you might expect. Old World Blue Stem was highly, we, we controlled it very well. It went from 20.9 down to 0.2%. That's you know, 95 plus percent control with glyphosate in that particular year. But what happened to the warm season grasses? about the same. Handful survived, but went from 29, almost 30%, down to less than 1% of the cover. So it, as you would expect, uh, it, it's gonna hurt those warm season grasses. It may not wipe them all out, but it took most of them out. Uh, Forbes, you know, they tripled out in the cover on those plots. And you know, that, that's the one I'll mention then. Some of those same Forbes I mentioned before, you know, um, yeah, Louisiana sage, ward, heath aster. Uh, then I'd see ironweed, uh, mare's tail, ground cherries. Some years we'd see wavy leaf thistle, you know. So some of those are, aren't so bad and then some aren't very good in terms of what we'd like to see. But that was in, the, in those roundup plots. If we look at the arsenal data that same year, the control of the old world blue stem was, was maybe a little over 80%. Wasn't as effective as the two pounds of glyphosate but didn't decrease the warm season grasses. They, they started at 25% and were up to 31% of the cover. So again, most of those warm season grasses at that particular lo location, primarily what I have is Indian grass and little blue stem would be, the, there's others, but those are the two main ones uh, that seem, seem to be present and take the, the arsenal treatment. Sure. Um, of course, the cattle aren't eating the uh, old world now, and so I've got old world that's about up to waist high on my pasture. When you're applying this in June, did you go through and, and basically mow down the old world, or did you just spray it? The recommendation would be get rid of that old growth in some fashion. Uh, at, in the Chase County, we were burning them off. They were, they were burned off and, and before I treated. Uh, the first the initial year at Riley County, that was done. Then the second year, they didn't do that. But yeah, you'd want to get rid of the old growth so you, so you get the herbicide on fresh new growth. I was applying 20 gallon sprayer, you know, just boom, boom sprayer. Yeah, so the next table I have in there is, yeah, it was 2018, kind of repeat of that. And, and again, in that case, uh, the glyphosate, again, was, well, about 90% effective on the old world blue stem. In that particular year, uh, imazapir was more effective than glyphosate. Many years, 
life stage seems to be affected, like I say, that two pound rate is probably marginal, particularly if it's a dry year. I think Keith had some studies where he found that out. He's had to about hit it twice in those years to get very effective control. And I've, I've seen that. And then occasionally we'll have a year when for some reason arsenal hasn't worked as well as we thought it would either. So it's, it doesn't always, always work well. It has the advantage over glyphosate in that, I think in the dry year, uh, arsenal will have some soil activity and will carry over for a while. And, and that could take, you know, provide some growth or control later into the season. Um, again, in that, in that 2018 study, um, again, the Forbes, you look at them, they're, they're pretty, uh, pretty good percentage. Uh, you know, on the Mazapir treatment, there wasn't, wasn't very many present, you know, initially, and then it went up to high as 38% of the cover. So big response in the Forbes. Uh, the glyphosate, pretty, pretty much similar. We've done some other work, yeah, then I've got a study here where I'm just kind of, again, looking at those two rates, again, a half pound of Mazapir, two pounds of glyphosate. Some of these studies, we've actually been treating two years in a row now to see what that would, would do. Again, I think they sprayed was it three years in a row here. So we, you know, we've done a little bit with two years in a row a couple different times. And uh, in that, that time frame again, and again, I think the weather was maybe dry, uh, the mazapir did appear to be a little better than, than the two pounds of glyphosate in those studies. So I don't know, any, any other questions you might have? Now that's that's a little tricky. I, I look at that label, and they talk about aerial application of arsenal, but when on the section that talks about range and pasture, they said can be applied in any ground applied method or some some terminology like that. And uh, so I'm not sure why, you know, but but I it's, it's kind of a gray area to me. I I don't know. It's, the product is labeled for range and pasture, but whether we can put it on by air. See, it still seems to be a question. I guess I would say, like any other product, the more water you put on with, you know, as a carrier you have, the better coverage you're going to have. So if, if, if you're going to do it by ground rig, more water carrier, I would say the better, so you get better coverage in the same way with the plane. If, um, if, you're, if you find somewhere that's able to put it on with the plane, yeah. Um, the more carrier they're able to do, the better coverage you're going to have. We had a location set up where we were going to try some aerial application, but it didn't didn't happen here the last year or two, probably because of COVID. But um, so we haven't really looked at it. But that, as I read that label, it's it's a little, I say, gray area to me whether we can really do that. But I think Keith is right. We we found that out with Cerise Lespedeza. You know, the pilots they'll like to put on the lowest volume they can, carry a bigger payload, right? Well, and they do that, put out a couple of gallons, they, they were getting very poor control of Ceresia. And I would expect that with the old real blue stem as well, that, you know, three, four, five gallons would be better. If, if it was labeled, I'd probably encourage people even to go to the helicopter route, because I know I can get on, you know, five to 10 gallons that way. But I'm not sure we can recommend that at this point in time. Yeah, question. Yeah, you got like I say, the rate's really important. Yeah. And uh, if you uh, if you're putting on a half pound and you overlap, now you got a pound on there, you could see more more damage. And I've seen some people do that with yeah with small rigs, and they were they were overdoing it. One of those things with well, if a little's good, more's better. Well, with it, with those that, that product, you got to be be careful because it, it's a bare ground treatment if you get a high enough rate. In fact, my first first experience with Arsenal was was creating bare ground on Fort Riley on their some of their lots, you know, and I found that worked pretty good. But I think I was using maybe two pounds uh, to do that. I did some spot spraying out where the little patches starting out in the pasture with that rate. And last year, there wasn't like any limit. Like the thing you have to watch with, with Arsenal is, is the actual product you have. The original products were two pounds per gallon. Well, now you, you can also buy four pounds per gallon product. And so the percentage you'd use in a mix should be half as much with that four pound per gallon product. So you gotta be careful about that.
I guess the other thing I had on there and, and uh, just some control options, uh, you know, spot treating with, with glyphosate, you know, individual plants or, or small patches uh, can work quite well. Uh, again, you know, if it wasn't too big of an area, again, you're gonna recognize you're, you're going to uh, take out most, most of the species uh, when you use glyphosate. Uh, I know Keith, you had a study where they, where they were doing that and uh, you know, pretty big reduction initially with, with uh, glyphosate treatments. Uh, treated a couple of years in a row and two or three years in a row and you about eliminate, seemed like it almost eliminated. I think in your study, Keith, you found that uh, Cytoch grama was, was a species, this was down in Butler County, I believe. It was a species, the native grass that seemed to be coming back in those spots. Uh, you know, in spot treating, you know, again, I. Yeah, you may create some bare ground, but uh, I tell people it's not not original for me. But you know, uh, Mother Nature is not a nudist. She's going to fill it in with something, right? And in this case, many times it's going to be broadly species initially. But you know, it'll it'll get something there to hold help hold the soil in, in place. Uh, so I talk about a one to one and a half percent solution there in terms of if I was going to spot spray with with a glyphosate product. I didn't mention wiping or wicking on glyphosate. Keith had looked at that. And again, uh, if you have a height differential, you know, between old world blue stem and, and the other plants that you don't want to affect, that, that approach can work. Probably want to treat both directions so you get enough, uh, like probably a 50% solution of glyphosate on those plants. The problem is though, again, you, you'll probably have some seedlings or things that are below what you're wiping. Those could survive. You know, but you know, it, it can, can help reduce the stand. Uh, I'm sure when, when we, uh, when I visited with Bruce here initially, we thought about, you know, because 80 to 100 acres or whatever it was of, of old world blue stem here, you know, what are some of the options? You know, do you start over? Again, it, it probably was, I don't know, this area prob probably had been cropped at some point in time and it was planted back in here. Uh, you know, we've had Roundup Ready crops for some time, so that seemed like a logical option. You know where okay spray it spray it out plant on a roundup ready crop and uh, you might have to do that for a period of time use up the seed bank uh, for a period of time of the old world blue stem and, and i don't know whether we figured out how long that is three to five years we're going to say something like that at least um, and uh, you know so that that becomes an option uh, as already mentioned you know if i'm going to apply a herbicide and i've got that old previous year's growth on there get rid of that, you know, burn it off, mow it off, get it off somehow so you get the herbicide on, on the fresh green green growth. Uh, the Mazapir Arsenal, if you have a mixed stand where you still have some native grasses left in there, that seems to be a, a good approach. Uh, we, we can uh, reduce back the old world blue stem and, and the native grass and some of the broadleafs will, will come back in. Uh, and again, I say up maybe a half a pound, I think is plenty uh, of, you know, active ingredient of, of, uh, of the amazapir. Of course, still looking at, you know, this is one of the few studies I'm, I'm aware of that where they've looked at renovation of a site. And, uh, you know, we may need to do some more of that, but I think this, this is a pretty good example of what, what can happen. Um, and, you know, like I say, you walking out here, they haven't completely eliminated uh, the Caucasian blue stem, but you know, right here as I look around, you know, I don't see any. I saw a few plants when I was walking over here, but you know, most of it's it's been considerably reduced. And I think Keith will talk about about those changes. Another question? If you're going to replant grass and plan on respraying it with arsenal, what varieties of grass would be best for the plant? Well, uh, again, I think these these taller grass, tall and mid high grasses. That we typically have used in in CRP type planting seem to be pretty tolerant. You know, so big and little blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass, cytoch grama. I think those will, will tolerate pretty well. Uh, and you know, that that's pretty standard mix we use throughout the state, even clear to the western edge. Uh, you know, some places you might put some short grass in there, blue grama or something. But uh, trouble with blue grama and buffalo grass. Uh, they tend to be a little more sensitive to herbicides to begin with. So, you know, you're going to probably at least stun them, if not outright hurt them. 
So I, you know, like I say, I think what they planted here, as I look around, I think those, I can tell you what they planted, but that kind of looks like the mix that was used to me. As I see lots of Indian and, and uh, little blue stem here. So this was killed off completely and then reseeded. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll cover that in just a little bit. But. Yeah, I, I guess the one thing I'll mention about reseeding, one of the, one of the potential problems of, of these old world blue stems, they've been shown to be allelopathic. Meaning, you know, there, there's a something that's compound that's leached out of the material that affects negatively the growth of other plants, and so that's that's a potential issue you have to deal with. Um, so again, you know, can if you kill it off, can you immediately plant some of these species in there? Keith, I know you you've looked at some cover crop sort of things, haven't you, in, in those stands? And uh, of course. Maybe dry weather has as much to do how they respond as, as the lelopathic, but uh, you know that, that that is a concern. Um, so sometimes it may take a period of time. One, you know, uh, well, enough said about that. I think. Other questions. So is the toxin in the root or in the <coughs> material that's above the ground? So if you burn it off, do you have to get rid of it or not? Well, I think it's probably it could be kind. Of, I don't remember they, in their little studies. One of the problems with allelopathic studies is, is you know, you, you, you collect plant, you can make an extract from the leaves or the roots, you know, put that in a water solution, and you grow your seeds in a petri dish, you know, and you put it on there, it shows at least they have the potential, you know, if, it, if they have a negative effect. But is that real, real scenario, what happens out in the field? Uh, I think that's real debatable. Um, but they did show some negative effects, I think, with big and little blue stem. From leachate. They've uh, shown reduction of mycorrhizae uh, of, with, with native grasses, the mycorrhizae that associate with it, and also of um, little blue stem itself from leachate of litter and also just collecting soil. Um, you know, it's hard telling if, you know, there could have been root material in that soil but it's been from leachate from the litter above and also from soil collected in between plants both where they found reduction. Again, that should you know disappear over time, but again, how long is it at a high enough concentration where it's gonna be a problem when you try to reseed something? Yeah, if you're way south and east of here, how about max two fish? Yeah, I, I don't know whether it it's, uh, will have a be affected negatively or not, but uh, I'm not knowing. I guess I don't know anybody that's tried that yet, but uh, it'd be worth looking at probably. The fescue has the same effect as it puts out a natural product. No. I, I would suspect that you would have a fescue crop in the spring and a overall blue stem crop in the summer. That's what I expect you would get from that. Okay. I don't, I, I don't think that they would really compete with each other. I bet you would have two crops. One of fescue and one of overall blue stem each year. That's, that's what I would expect would happen. Okay. Based on what I've seen with how it's uh, grown in areas where they're smooth grown. Suppose you'd have a 100 acre pasture so in one corner you had 10 acres that was sowed back to grass years ago. You go out there and burn it, spray it, re <coughs> recommended time. Can you put cattle in the whole pasture or should you fence that off separately? Well, gen generally reseeded ground is, is usually the plants that are there. Now, if, if you just burn that patch and didn't burn the rest of the pasture, that probably would attract them to that area. Well, that's the thing. You just wanted to burn that patch as well. Yeah. Yeah, we thought about that even with small clumps of old world blue stem and pastures is, is go out and just burn them off. Don't burn the whole pasture, just burn the patches of old world blue stem and they'll, that would attract animals to that new growth. So that may be kind of like what you're talking about well, doing. We spray it and... I don't think you can hurt old world blue stem grazing it. Well, <laughs> that isn't quite what I meant. I mean, you know, some of that native will be coming back. 
And the cat will be over there nibbling on it too, won't it? Yeah. Well, it's, it's you know, kind of like if it's a little extreme case, but like, like say where we talk about patch burning, where we just burn a portion of the pasture, yeah, the animals are going to concentrate on that area you burn. The way we get around that so we don't cause long-term damage is we burn a different portion the next year. But, it, you know, a lot of times if we have just seeded ground and native, a lot of times they're managed better separately. Ten acres, I don't know whether it's worth fooling with, though. Talk. They'll concentrate on the area that was burned. Yeah. So you just turn them out there and duck fences off separate. But if you, it really depends on how much old world blue stem was there to start with and how much natives in that little area if it would get damaged or if they would, they may diffuse out into the other 90 acres and utilize quite a bit of it too. There's probably not enough dry matter production there to meet their needs or I'm sure they would graze elsewhere in the pasture. But they might keep that tend to keep it grazed down. That's what I mean. So, um, should we move on? Yeah. So anyway, thanks Walt for coming out here. Um, now, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the actual project that took place right here where we're, where we're standing. And uh, as I mentioned before, I was contacted by Brian several years ago about this project because he was a part of the original uh, uh, some of the original folks that uh, developed the, the project and, and collected the initial data. And so he called me and informed me about this project going on and I was really interested in it because this 240 acre area is the largest area that I know of that has tried to do any sort of renovation of converting old world blue stem uh, invaded pasture back into improved pasture. And so I was really curious about, about this project. And so that's how I got involved. And so if you look on the very front of the sheet for, for my handout, uh, Walt had talked earlier, uh, he had mentioned that he thought that some of this area was old crop ground. Well, that, that's correct. The northern half of this 240 acre tract was old crop ground. We're on some terraced area right here. And uh, there's, a, there's a pond just over the hill to the south. And just on the south side of that pond, all the way north to the road up here was old crop ground. And sometime back in the 1950s or 60s, it was seeded back to grass. And there must have been some old world blue stem contamination in that grass seed. Because over the course of time, that old world blue stem had, uh, it had formed plant, plants that were vigorous, formed seed, that seed dropped and just kept expanding over the course of this pasture. So uh, at the time of 2016, if you turn and look at the very first table that's in, that's in that uh, sheet, in 2016, in the initial data that Brian took, before any treatments were done here. I have a list there of all the data of the, of the vegetative cover that was on this 240 acre tract. And the northern part of this 240 acre tract had transects one, three, four, six, seven, and eight on it. Now, if you average out those tracts it's just under 75% of the vegetative cover in this northern part, the old crop ground, had oral blue stem cover on it. Where we're standing at right here, from this green post to the green post just south of me, that's transect number six. It had just under 75% oral blue stem cover from that green post to the south green post. So three-fourths of the vegetation, if you walked a straight line from one post to the other, was old world blue stem in 2016 when that first data was taking place. Okay, The other heavy area was on the West Hill, where Walt had some of his original herbicide plots on that western hill over there. Uh, 70 to 80, and I think one of them was even 90-some percent old world blue stem cover in 2016 prior, prior to this project starting. Okay, 
So what took place after 2016? Well, uh, starting in 2016, uh, when Brian took the initial data, in 2017 it was the first year of herb herbicide treatment. <clears throat> that spring, they burned the pastures. They got rid of all the old dead material. And then they sprayed with half pound an acre, uh, uh, a half pound of arsenal or imazapir per acre. All right, and they did that in 2017. In 2018, they did the same thing, okay? And they also did the same thing in 2019. Well, if you look on that, that very first table, you can see that from 2016 to 2019, there's a big drop in the vegetative cover of old world blue stem between those two years, okay? Especially on this, this transect right here where we're standing, transect six. Walt had mentioned that he didn't see any old world blue stem while where he was just standing right here. And in the two year, last two years of collecting data along this transect, we haven't found any old world blue stem from one post to the other. Now there is old blue stem around, um, but it's more isolated. It's, it's, it's more disperse. Instead of being in large monocultures, there are smaller patches that are dispersed all throughout the pasture. And Dustin had done some uh, mapping this summer with uh, Bruce, and he's got uh, some pretty good mapping of where a lot of those patches are at, where it's more, more concentrated. But there is still some over a blue stem out here. All right, so we went from just over 50% vegetative cover in 2016, uh, when you look at both areas combined, the south part that stayed native and the north part that was in crop ground, just over 50% vegetative cover was over a blue stem. And then in 2019 and 2020 and 2021, around 5% or less. So we had a 90% reduction in oral blue stem cover from those treatments. Um, that's a pretty significant reduction. So we're talking about almost half of the vegetative cover in this pasture disappeared in those years. And so that leaves the question, you know, what, what took its place? Well, um, if you go to the next table, table number two, which is on the back, you'll see in 2019, after those three years of, of herbicide treatment, basically what took the place of that overall blue stem was western ragweed and mare's tail, Forbes. Exactly what Walt had said filled in his uh, small plots up on the hill when he used uh, uh, his herbicide treatments. He had mare's tail fill in those areas. Well, that's exactly what filled in this pasture was mare's tail and western ragweed. And uh, I tell you, it was, it was actually a pretty sorry sight at that time. I know, I know Bill <laughs> was thinking, what in the world are we doing out here, I'm sure, at that time? Because it really looked like a mess, didn't it? It did. Um, and he, I, I bet he was really questioning the whole process of doing this at that time. So anyway, 2019, we had a lot of mare's tail and a lot of western ragweed. And we needed something to fill in all that area because um, there was going to be a lot of soil without, without much grass root cover on top of it or holding that soil in place. So part of this contract was also uh, a contract to do some reseeding. And so they did do a seeding in 2020, in the spring of 2020. And that, that seed mix was mostly native tall grasses and a little bit of blue grama and some native forbs. Okay, the native forbs that were included in that were showy partridge pea, there was uh, purple prairie clover, um, there was Maximilian sunflower, and I believe there was some pitcher sage, is what was in that, in that mix for Forbes. 
Now, we did not see many of those Forbes uh, come up in that, in that uh, seeding year of 2020. All right, we did not see much of that. Uh, part of the reason could be that we had so much um, uh, cover of mare's tail rosettes in the spring of that 2020 that we actually put down eight ounces of dicamba across this pasture to get rid of that mare's tail so it wouldn't compete with the native grass when it came up. We did wait uh, 45 days um, before seeding the grass, like what's recommended on the label, uh, but we still didn't have much of those forbs show up that very first year. Okay, But um, even before we seeded though, if you look at that table, that table number two, in 2019, you know, we had that big reduction in overall blue stem and western ragweed and mare's tail had a big increase, but also look at big blue stem. In 2016, it was less than 1% cover of big blue stem, but in 2019, it was almost 5%. Okay, little blue stem went from 7% in 2016 to over 16% in 2019. All right, and then Indian, Indian grass also went from uh, 2% up to 5%. So our native tall grasses, even before seeding, were increasing, probably because of less competition from that oral blue stem. But it wasn't increasing fast enough to fill all that voided area from the oral blue stem. So we did go ahead and do a reseeding. Now, one thing that you'll notice on here that Walt did talk about was uh, the sensitivity of buffalo grass and blue grama to a lot of herbicides. Well, if you look on that table on the line of blue grama plus buffalo grass, in 2016, originally it, it had about 14% cover. Well, in 2019, after those three years, it was down to around 1%. So that arsenal treatment was really hard on buffalo grass and blue grama. All right, but the warm season native grasses that were tall grasses did tolerate it fairly well and, and we had an increase. It just wasn't enough to fill that empty space that the overall blue stem that had died left. So we needed some soil cover. So we seeded in 2020 and look at those uh, tall grasses then in 2020. Indian grass went from 5% cover to 13 and a half. Big blue stem went from 5% cover to 18. Little blue stem went from 16 to 27. And mare's tail went from 25 down to five. So having that grass there as competition really reduced that mare's tail. And then when we did our uh, data collection this summer, 2021, we didn't detect any mare's tail in any of our uh, quadrats when we sampled our transects. So the mare's tail had, has essentially disappeared over time in the, in the bulk of this pasture. You know, you still may see some in some of the high traffic areas um, around the gates, around the water tanks and things like that. But in the bulk of the pasture, the mare's tail has, has mostly disappeared, okay? And then Walt had talked about the allelopathic effect of the old world blue stem. Well, we had really successful establishment of our native grasses after those three years of, of herbicide treatment. So uh, apparently enough time had gone by, enough rainfall and enough growth of uh, other vegetation and, and microbial activity in the soil had occurred to really dissipate that allelopathic chemical that was in the soil that affects uh, native grass growth. So we, we had excellent establishment in 2020. Um, so any, any questions about any of that at the moment? Yes? Keith, I might have missed it, but in 2020, did you spray Mazapir on it? Oh, uh, good question. In 2020, did we spray a Mazapir? And the answer is no. They had three years of their contract where they broadcast sprayed a Mazapir. In 2020, when we seeded, we did not do any spraying. The only spraying that, uh, that did occur was some small uh, spot spraying that Bruce had done from a ATV in areas that, that needed some attention. 
And so he, he did some uh, spot spraying with an ATV. But as far as overall broadcast spraying in the pasture, we didn't do any large scale spraying in that 2020 year. Well, the, the imazapir really didn't, really didn't hurt the native tall grasses at all. Um, they, you know, they've survived through it. They actually increased in, in cover in those three years where, where it was being treated. So the native tall grasses weren't really affected by it. What was affected were, were the small short grasses, native short grasses. Um, and if you look on, on the sheet there, we did have an increase from 2020 to 2021 of blue grama and buffalo grass. And it was a significant increase from 2020 to 2021. That's what the little asterisk means in that table. Um, but there was not, not, uh, not any large broad scale chemical application in 2020. Now here in 2021, Bruce did the same thing. He did some spot spraying with his ATV in areas. And you may be able to see some of those plants if you went wandering around here. Um, you probably see some of those plants that he treated. But um, over the course of these five years, we've gone from a cover of over 50% overall blue stem and 75% overall blue stem at this location right here at this transect to where there's less than 5% cover. That's a pretty significant uh, decrease. You know, it, it, it took a lot of effort and it, and it took a lot of resources as far as monetary resources. Um, but I'd say so far they've been successful in, in, in having a significant reduction. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what the cost of the application was the those treatments that were that were put out because uh, you know there's different costs of imazapir depending on what what brand of imazapir you purchase, but I would say that those treatments are probably anywhere from thirty to forty dollars an acre to apply it. I don't know, had, had you broken that down at all, Bill, to to know what that is? I did that first year. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think it was even a little higher than that. Was it that first year? Okay, so using using the trade name Arsenal herbicide was more expensive, and now that there's some um, more generic brand branding available, that same chemical, it's cheaper. Yeah, I got a question over there. Uh, that is a good question. In the five years, did we do any grazing at all? Uh, the label on Imazapir states that if you uh, treat more than 10% of your pasture area that there is a grazing restriction and grazing is not allowed. So for those three years, they did not graze when they treated the whole pasture. Okay. In 2020, when they reseeded the whole pasture, overseeded, they also did not graze because they would, didn't want to damage all those little seedlings that were starting to come up. So they went four years without any grazing on, on this pasture. Here in 2021, they grazed the native pasture to the east during the first half of the growing season. And they allowed this area here, um, they allowed those new seedlings to get more established and they deferred grazing on this western area until, uh, well, it's probably close to the first part or middle of July, I think, when when uh, Bill moved animals into here. So this last half of the growing season is the only time in the last five years where they've had any grazing. Okay, so that of course is going to add on to the cost because you're losing revenue, right? So it, it's not a it's not a cheap fix or, or management scenario here by any means. Yeah. So the, the, this tall stuff's pretty dang good. I 
mean, it's most of it's, it's all native stuff, but how do you get back to that short grass in the long term? Okay, the question was that, you know, there's a lot of the tall grass here, but how do you get the short grass back? Um, I would say in this region of the state, um, we would prefer to have more of the tall grasses here because they're more productive. They're going to produce more, more biomass, more dry matter, and more grazing days. So I, we prefer to have more of these tall grasses in here. Now, as you get further west, um, you know, you, we usually have more, sh more of the short grasses in our native pastures. And so you tend to see more of those short grasses as we get further west. But in this area here, I, I would say having uh, none to a small amount of, of the short grasses is actually more desirable. So for like back, back at RS, how we'd like a little bit more short grass in the mixture, get a little bit more punch in it for the, for the grazing. Um, and the nutritional value of the short grasses. Yeah, the, the nutritional value of the short grasses is definitely better later in the season than our tall grasses. The tall grasses will decline in quality much faster than uh, our short grasses do out west. Um, so how could you get uh, that in, back into stuff that had a, once you get, get it to this point or to the season okay. point, how do you get the, the short grasses to take hold? So how, how would we try to establish those once we got rid of the old world blue stem? Yeah. Um, and we overseeded with more native tall grasses. Well, you could include just more of the short grass in the mix. It was a very small part of the mix in this, blue grama was. Uh, you could include more of it in the mix and you'd get a bigger percentage of it established. Um, the other way we get it to convert tall grasses to short grasses as you get further west is just graze it harder because heavy grazing is going to reduce those tall grasses over time and more short grasses will take over. Um, so that, that's, that's the other way you can convert it. Um, in most cases, I, I, I would usually prefer to have more of the tall grasses in place than the short grasses, but, but we can convert that through grazing management if, if you want to increase your buffalo grass and blue grama. So any other questions about this whole process that took place? Keith, what's he spot spraying with? Uh, the question is, what's he spot spraying with? And he is spot spraying with the imazapir. Um, trying to calibrate it for a, for a half pound an acre rate. Um, sometimes when you're spot spraying, it's a little more difficult to hit that, to hit that uh, target, but that's, that's what he's going for. Um, I should mention that uh, earlier it was talked about uh, turn, turn, turn rows and turnaround areas. And there is a location in the southern part of this pasture where there are some deeper ravines where they sprayed up to the, the deeper ravine and, and then did some border spraying area. And that double treatment on those areas did uh, suppress and injure the little blue stem in those areas. Um, it has started to come back, but it's, it's definitely thinner than what it was uh, beforehand on those native areas where there wasn't overall blue stem. Just having that double spray did, did do a little bit of damage on those natives there. Yeah, another question. Yeah, and I don't mean to be a pain in the rear, but that seed, the overall blue stem seed, how long is it going to be viable in the ground? Okay, good question. The question was, how long is that overall blue stem seed going to be viable in the ground? We collected seedling data on, along these transects each year. And uh, with the burning regimen and with the arsenal or the imazapir treatment every year that they put down, there were very few seedlings that we found in our recruitment here. Uh, there was very little seedling recruitment of oral blue stem. Now, if, if uh, we weren't burning the area or we weren't treating with imazapir um, to limit seed production from mature plants, for, to keep plants from getting mature. Um, the seed bank that's, un that's under this canopy in the soil, we could have seedlings come up for three or four years. That seed could last in there for three or four years. In areas that we treated with Roundup, 
for, for two years and followed seedling density for three years, we had a decline in seedling density each and every year, up to the three years. And we had a very low amount of seedlings emerge that third year. And I imagine going into the fourth year, it would have reduced even further, but there still is potential for some to occur. And there, there very well could be, be some seedlings that are going to emerge over time in this pasture because we still do have 5% vegetative cover of oral blue stem here that's producing seed. So there still is seed being produced here. And hopefully some of the management that they have planned for the future is going to help keep that in check. Because I've been messing with this whole world for quite a, quite a few years now. I started out just a small spot and invaded the whole pasture. So I've been mowing and spraying uh, with arsenal for two or three years. And arsenal works, but it's like anything else. You have to be on top of it. You're going you to have to spot spray for quite a few years. Yeah, it's it's not a short term. It's not a short term deal. It's going it, to with with herbicide treatment. It's going to take repeated effort, repeated years of treatment because the the oral blue stem does have that seed bank, and so new new seedlings will emerge. I sprayed some last summer. It's the spot that just started. The first time was con the first year, and I sprayed up the arsenal, and I didn't see anything there this spring. Yeah. You can keep it from spreading is the main thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you can keep it from spreading. Yep. Now we uh, we did do some tracking of oral blue stem patches on in a couple of our pastures at our research center at Hayes. And we found that over the course of eight years and nine years in two different pastures that the compounded growth rate of those patches was about 15%. So those the, the annual compounded growth rate of those patches was uh, a pretty high rate, 15%. You know, that, you know, Pete, you making that comment makes me question whether it was in soil bank. Because if it was in soil bank 60 years ago, it would have covered everything out. Really the, up. well, the, the patches that I'm talking about at Hayes weren't soil bank. That's just native pasture where it invaded. Well, I've got land that was soil bank. Okay. And I've watched the last 10 years, I've seen that stuff literally move north. I have a hard time believing that was soil bank because it would have taken over my whole place yeah. by now. Uh, well, it, if it was, yeah, I, if it was a, a contaminated seed that had a lot of seed in it originally, yeah, it, it probably very well could have taken over, just like it did in here. You know, we had 50% over the whole area yeah, and 70%. Yeah. And so, um, you know, the, and that would have been in the 50s and 60s when it first came. And that's how long it took to get to that point of 75% cover in this northern part. For those of us that can't afford four, four or five years of lost income, is there any management tools that we can have to use? That is a really great question. Um, is there any management tools that you have besides broadcast spraying over the whole area and, and, um, and that cost and the loss of income if you spray more than 10%. And that, that is a great segue into our next speaker. Because our, our next speaker is uh, Mickey Ramirez. And Mickey Ramirez is a graduate student with Casey Olson in the Animal Science D Department in Manhattan. And he has a project in, the, uh, in a different region here of Ellsworth County where he is doing summer or growing season burns to try to reduce the overall blue stem. Yeah. I'll make one more comment before you know, the K-State people are going to leave. This overall blue stem is up and down every greater ditch in our county. And you go from here to, to peak on the interstate, and it's all along the interstate. Millions and billions of acres of prime grassland. Who's responsible for that overall blue stem in those areas? So the question, or the comment was that there's overall blue stem in road ditches basically all throughout most of Kansas. And who's responsible for those? Well, um, I don't know who's responsible for those. I can, I can tell you that on our research center where we have it, we don't have near the funds that we would need to or the labor to be able to control the overall blue stem that's on our property. 
Um, and I'm sure it's going to be that way for every roads department probably throughout the state. There's probably not enough uh, labor or funding for doing any sort of herbicide treatment on, on those areas. Does the owner, the pasture owner adjacent to the road, does he have the right to go in there and control that? You pay taxes does, to the middle of the road, I believe. Does the pasture owner have the right to go in and do something about that? I do not know. That's a question for someone else other than me. I do not know that answer. If I had a pasture with that next to it, I'd, from my past experience, that's where mine came from. I'd sure be getting rid of that on the other side of the fence. And, uh, you know, it's found in a lot of these road ditches all throughout the state. And I... I don't think that it was purposely seeded in those road ditches. I think it was kind of like these areas that were crop ground at one time that they seeded back to a native mix. I think they probably had some contaminated seed. I don't think it was ever part of an intentional seeding um, that they had. I think it was probably contaminated seed or hay bales moved from different locations used as a mulch. You know, if we bring in hay from Oklahoma or Texas as a mulch, for, for some projects, it's a pretty high likelihood that there could be oral blue stem in that, in that hay that's used as mulch. So part of trying to uh, reduce oral blue stem within the state is just being more careful about preventing it from getting on, on those properties in the first place. If you're using hay for any sort of mulch for a project, make sure you know what the source of that hay is. Um, like you yourself then, if it's in your road ditches and you go out and you, you harvest those ditches as a feed source, you know, anywhere that you take that hay then could potentially spread that old world blue stem. Anywhere we drive an implement, a mower, um, a wind rower, driving a vehicle into a patch of old world blue stem and then driving it into a pasture where it's not found, that's potential for that seed to hitch a ride on those implements and then get started wherever that vehicle drives. So uh, prevention is a big part of trying to reduce the occurrence of oral blue stem within the state. So I unfortunately do not have a handout for you guys, so you'll just have to listen to me talk instead. So as Keith said, I've got a project just south of here, just on the other side of Canopolis Lake where we're looking at using prescribed fire to control Caucasian, as opposed to using herbicides or some other methods. So there was a f some research so a few years ago out of Texas that indicated that burning during the growing season sometime between June and September could knock back some of the yellow blue stem without negatively impacting a lot of the native uh, grasses and forbs down there. So that was sort of the basis of our project to see if we could recreate some of that up here, but instead of the yellow blue stem, we've got the Caucasian up here. So we have 18 plots down there of one acre by one acre, and we have a no burn, and then we have stuff that was burned in August. It was burned August 14th of 2019, so two years ago now. So we collected data before the fire, and then we've been collecting data these last two years as well. And the future of that project is going to include monitoring that for another two more years. And additionally, some of that was burnt in August of this year. So we'll have no burns. We'll have stuff that was burnt just once in 2019. And additionally, there will be a, a, another group then in a few years that was burnt this year and in 2019. So with the prescribed fire, obviously out here, a lot of people are using those dormant season burns in the springtime but obviously some of this old world stuff doesn't care about that you know in manhattan there at the beef stock unit we've got some yellow blue stem that's creeping up from the road into one of the pastures and that's in the spring burn and it if anything is helping it move through there but out here with our burn project after our first burn in August of 2019, we saw a 48% reduction in that Caucasian blue stem cover in those burn plots, where it was unchanged in some of those non-burn plots. And out there, it was about this high, and that litter was three to four inches deep. They hadn't burned it for a few years before we'd been out there. And it is grazed, but this portion of the pasture that has this Caucasian is only about 30, 40 acres of this entire pasture. And out there, it appears that the cattle 
aren't really utilizing that at all. There are spots within those big monocultures of that Caucasian where you'll have a little spot of some native grass and you'll see that's been mowed down and none of the Caucasian around it has been touched at all. Um, we get out there in the morning sometimes and they bed down in it. Those calves just disappear when they lay down so they like to sleep in it but again they just don't appear to be eating it when they've got native grass to be eating. In 2020, so last year, or no, 2021 and this year, from 2019 to 2021, there was a 52% reduction of Caucasian. So over time, it had gone down that 48% reduction in 2020, and then in 2021, it was a 52% reduction from 2019. And when we looked at the total composition of grasses and forbs in that field as well, that reduction of Caucasian resulted in slight reductions to the total grass in those pastures. But again, that was mainly just that Caucasian. Most of that native stuff just appeared to not have cared at all that we burnt it. We did see some slight increases in some of the cool season grasses out there. And we were concerned that some of that might be some of the Kentucky blue or some of the smooth brome that's out there. But when we went back and looked at it, it was mainly Scribner's panicum and some of the sedges. So again, just some native stuff that, you know, we don't mind if it's there at all. We did unfortunately see reductions in total biomass out there. Those burn plots had roughly 800 pounds less of total biomass than the non-burn plots. But most of that just appears to be, again, that reduction in the Caucasian blue stem. A lot of the native stuff out there looks just fine. And we additionally looked at the Forbes too. And as Fick had said earlier about, you know, you kind of get come in and take out some of that old world and it pops up all with Forbes. We did see a flush and Forb cover that first year after we burned some of the annuals and there's some introduced stuff too but that little flush of forbs kind of went away after that first year so this year that the, the introduced and annual forbs weren't quite as high they were about the same that we saw in the non-burn pots and we looked at the species richness as well it just a number of species between the plots we saw in the burn plots there was increases to grass species richness which was mostly increases in some of the native grasses and in the forbs there were increases in forb species diversity in the first year after we burned which again is likely just linked to that little flush of forbs that we saw but the forb species diversity was not significantly different between both pastures and this year and one of the sort of most obvious things you see when you get out there is though that old world out there that litter is just so thick three to four inches thick in some spots and you know it's a bunch of grass so you'll have a bunch of caucasian here and a bunch of caucasian here and in between it's just straight litter so that fire we had went through there real hot and we had greater than 70 percent litter cover across those all those plots in that first year but after burning that it cleared out just about all that litter so in some of those burn plots there's just big spots of bare ground between where there used to be caucasian litter and within that bare ground is sort of where a lot of those forbs popped up so Mickey, you burned in September? august end of august the beginning 14th yeah and the field you're talking about had never been burned before it had been, but they delayed burning on that for a few years beforehand. So we had multiple years then before it had been burned again. Okay. Yeah, so that accumulation of litter was just the result of them not burning out there. But there are cattle out there. And um, so we did see big increases in bare ground out there. And our one of our concerns with that is we saw the pasture next to where we burnt they had sprayed with glyphosate three years prior to the start of our study and had killed just about all the grass out there, all the forbs. So it was just ragweed and sage wart and a bunch of weedy stuff. But they had somehow accidentally tracked in some bull thistle. And unfortunately this year, we found one bull thistle plant in one of our burn plots. And we're thinking just opening up that canopy and opening up some of that bare ground might have allowed some of that bull thistle to move in but again we only saw one of those plants and so we cut it down but you know it's just a hope that clearing out some of that old world doesn't allow room for some of those other undesirables to move in yep could you repeat your rationale why you're burning in august versus the spring 
sure. So there is some published data out there that suggests that in the springtime, it just doesn't do anything to any of the old worlds. If anything, it might help them even a little bit. And so there were a few studies that suggested that doing it during this growing season might knock it back. And so the rationale behind why it might work in the fall or in the summertime, I mean, just might be that this old world matures so much quicker than some of the, the native stuff that it gets to that reproductive stage a lot sooner and it's a lot vo more vulnerable in that stage than opposed to the vegetative stage. So if you can time that fire to hit the old world when it's more vulnerable and those natives are less vulnerable, then you can kind of knock it back without damaging some of those native plants. But you have to have the litter in August in order to get that burn down. Yeah, that was, when we burned this year, some of our burn plots, you know, where the old world had stayed through that first burn, those burned real hot. But there are some of those areas where it had really been knocked out in that first year and it was just a lot a lot more bare and a lot more sort of little blue and some of those other patchier natives that the fire didn't really push through there so yeah if you don't have the litter to, to have a fire then you can't have a fire there's a there's been well a handful of projects down in the southern states where they've looked at growing season burns for oral blue stem reduction. Some have worked well, some haven't worked well at all. Um, the ones that look like they have worked best or the areas that have been most successful look like the ones that have had the most fuel and probably the slowest burn to retain heat on that oral blue stem longest. There's also some data that, that suggests that the seeds of the old world are less tolerant to high heat as well compared to some of the natives such as Indian grass. So if you can get a real hot fire on some of those seeds, then you can reduce germination rates. Whereas the native stuff won't be reduced as much if you get can get that fire to push through there real hot. So if we're looking at doing an August burn 2022, can we just leave the grass the way it is now? Don't mow it, don't do anything. Just let it stay and let it build litter and then burn next year. Yep. We, we did see our original plan had been to burn, have a burn that was just in 2019 and then a burn in 2020. So we'd have two different burns. But when last year we went out there and there was not enough fuel. So just in, at least in this sort of ecosystem, you need at least a full year's worth of litter out there to be able to burn it in this late in the year. Yep. Yep. Are there areas within that that you can identify as, as problem areas that are they're not being it's not being reduced? Yeah, there are definitely some of those plots out there. Like I said, before we burnt, they're just solid wall to wall old world out there and coming in at, like if you go out there right now, well we burnt it, so there's not quite as much out there, but there are definitely portions of those those pastures where half of it burnt real well and half of it didn't burn as m well and so there's definitely still big clumps of old world out there well what, what i was thinking about is a multi-pronged approach where you're able to burn during a growing season and then also apply 10 percent you know of your of imazapir over 10 percent of that area that's a that's a major issue potentially yeah and just kind of rotating that over the years yeah again you just you need to give it enough time to get enough litter and so out there i think that might have been part of it is that there were spots out there of native grass and so some of the that didn't burn as hot that first year and so it didn't burn that old world around it as much and so yeah definitely using two different approaches might help i'll say that that's one of the reasons why i invited mickey to come and talk with us today because using one one method or one approach to reduce an invasive species doesn't always work. You know, the more tools you have and implement, the usually more effective control you're going to have. You know, we see that with, with herbicides on crop fields. Using one mode of action, you know, you get resistance over time and, and you end up getting tolerance to that. Whereas if you use different modes of action, 
usually able to get better control. Well, this is the same way. Instead of using herbicide, only herbicide, having another tool in the toolbox to help come at the problem from a different direction, you know, could it help improve the overall control that you see? You know, uh, his result, you know, 50% reduction instead of 90%, not quite as much, but I'm sure it cost way less and still would have had potential for revenue on that pasture, you know, from doing that approach. So there's, you know, there's, there's pluses and minuses from all methods, but doing a combination of them, you may get the best, best ending result. Any native grass come into your burn areas? Yep. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we did measure species richness, which is just number measure of the numbers of species between plots. So we saw increases in grass richness in the burn plots. So there definitely is little blue seems to be coming back the most out there, but there is Indian grass, there's switch grass, there's a bunch of the other there's uh, some of the gramas are coming back out there too, and some of the the more burnt out areas. I had another question over there. I was just curious if you burn in middle of August, is there enough time for old world to actually produce any kind of a seed head and or what it looked like after kind of at the end of that season? Yeah, um, I haven't been out there after the burn, immediately after, but from what we've been told by the landowner is that some of it did seed out, but of course it was a lot less than if it hadn't been burnt. So it, and just visually looking at some of the plants too. So it seemed like some of the big clumps got burnt out real good with that fire because they had so much litter there at the base and it kind of just straight killed them. But it seems that some of the smaller plants that weren't hit quite as hard suddenly have a big open area around them. And so it's just by visually looking, it seems that some of the, the plants that weren't hit by the burn kind of come back a little harder that next year. There's less competition for them from all the other old world that would have been around them. So, yeah. So you talked a little bit about the, the cattle not really grazing on the Caucasian blue stem. Um, could you just briefly describe what kind of grazing operation, what kind of cattle operation they have out there? Yeah, they have a cow-calf operation out there. Um, I mean, beyond that, I don't know what their stocking rate is out there. They, we did, after the burn, string up a hot wire to keep the cattle off that burned area for a little bit. And the rationale behind that was just, you know, obviously they're going to come graze it, and we didn't want them to hit that native stuff that was trying to come back quite as hard as they would have. I mean, obviously, if you let them graze it, they're going to eat that Caucasian too, but we just didn't want to factor that into any of our data, really. Well, it's a good grass for May and June. It'll mm -hmm. graze the hell out of it. Yeah, yeah, I, I've got pictures from out there where, you know, there's a burn plot and then a non-burn plot and a burn plot and you can see their little trails where they go from the burn plot to the burn plot and they don't even touch anything in the that thick Caucasian stuff. I've got an area in my former CRT that uh, I mowed down in uh, June and I had the cattle in there just last week and they were literally grazing the new growth that was on that damn stuff. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it just seems that once it gets to that certain maturity point, they just don't want anything to do with it. I've seen calves taking bites of it and then they just kind of decide they don't want to eat that and they'll walk away and find patches of native stuff. I've got a picture from you to me all the way around the square that I just mowed down in June. And 25 ahead are camped out right there. Just last week. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe I can mow it and let them graze it again. Yeah, but I think as Keith was saying earlier, it seems that you can graze it all you want and it kind of doesn't really do anything to it. Got to find a man. So you said you were burning in early August? Yeah, our burn was. August 14th, and then we did one this year. It was around the same time period. I don't remember the exact date. When, when would you say that burn window opens? Um, say it probably opens up in June. I know some of the, the papers I've been looking at, been 
they burnt in June and seen some of the same results, although that was down in Texas. So looks like June through September, kind of depending on where you're at and how well that's grown through. Um, precipitation too plays a big role. Seems that in drier years, it gets hit a lot harder. So if it's a wet year, even if you're burning in that growing season, you might not see the reduction you might have seen if it had been a dry year too. So sort of timing with the rain too. But of course we can't control that, so. Right, any other questions? This is a very prolific plant. It produces a hell of a lot of vegetation out there. Has anybody in Kansas looked at digging that stuff and getting rid of it based off of the hay? I can say a little bit of that. Uh, we've, we've hayed a little bit of ours, and I, it, it doesn't look like it grows back as much. But it still grows back, and it doesn't it doesn't spread as much, I don't think. But it doesn't really. I've noticed that when push I'm it mowing. Back. So when I mow it, you, know, you, you get clumps, and nothing's growing in the clumps because that damn stuff is just so vegetative. But it it slows the growth of it back. Then. I know that. And I'm thinking about getting it back with herbicide next year. Well, um, you're you're right. It is prolific. It'll produce a lot of pounds. And the, it's very grazing resistant and haying resistant. You can graze it off, mow it off, and keep utilizing that. You know, if you do that, you're going to keep it more vegetative over time, and it's going to be more nutritious and useful for cattle. Um, you're not going to reduce the stand of it at all, um, but you'll be getting more use out of it. Um, the one thing you would be doing possibly too would be getting rid of some of the seed production. Right. So maybe it wouldn't be spreading further out. But um, but you won't be reduced. I don't think you'd be reducing the stand that you're working on at all by doing that. You'll just be getting more use out of it. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Managing it instead of getting rid of it. Yeah. You'd be you'd be getting more use out of it by by defoliating, get rid of all that old material and stemming material. Um, you just get more use out of it. So, any other questions? So, how big were those test plots in Texas, Seth? I don't recall off the top of my head. So keep in mind, Texas grows this stuff as pasture. So, I can't imagine them spending too much time trying to get rid of it. <laughs> Most of the studies that I've that I've looked at, read through, have been areas that were small plots that were like. 40 feet by 40 feet in size all the way up to acre in size so it, it, it's very nothing that's on the scale of like a large pasture well and that's that's one of the things that appealed to me about this when we got started is because all of the imazapir treatments had been on you know pretty small plots and so being able to apply that on a larger scale and whether or not that'd be successful that, that's something that would be pretty interesting I'd say for a research study, one acre plot is actually pretty, pretty fair size. It's larger than what most research plots are. I know that the the landowner that we work with is planning after the end of our study to just burn it all again in August, and he really, he likes what he's seeing out there. So, all right, no other questions. All right. Uh, Hopefully you got some information from this field day. Um, there's been a lot of effort, a lot of time put into this uh, renovation project and um, it's good to get some of this information and data out for folks to be able to see. And I'm glad Mickey was able to come and, and show us another tool in the toolbox that possibly could be used for, for reducing the overall blue stem out in pasture. And also thanks to Walt Fit for coming out and and giving a summary of some of the herbicide work that be, that's been done. Uh, but most of all, thanks to Bruce and Margaret for letting us come out and use their property. So thank you very much. <laughs>